Good morning, everybody. You're really welcome this morning to our online service. Uh, we're going to begin today just by singing, For Thou, O Lord, are high above all the earth. Please join with me wherever you're worshipping with us this morning. Oh, the earth, the 
Good morning and thank you for joining with me this morning as we come around God's Word. I made an announcement last Sunday in Union Church and I wanted to make the same announcement this morning online. Uh, Cara and I have uh, made the announcement that we will be leaving Union Church uh, in September. Um, we have not managed to get visas to continue here. But we are convinced that God is in control. And so we are not uh, uh, doubting that God has wonderful plans for Union Church and he has plans for our lives as well. I do want to mention that these online services will continue indefinitely and I'm committed to this as long as we need these online services. Now we're in the book of Acts and we've been looking at Stephen over the past two weeks. We said in as we looked at Acts chapter 6, that Stephen was a man of character. And we see how he was filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with wisdom. Last week, we looked at the message that pre Stephen preached as he was trying to defend, as he was supposed to be defending himself. And we said he was a man of conviction. He spoke with incredible conviction. He wasn't concerned about his own life. He was concerned about declaring the message of Jesus Christ. And this morning I've entitled my message, Stephen, the first Christian martyr. So let's pick up our reading. Let's read verse 54 of chapter 7. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. Now remember, Stephen is here on trial for his life. He's been called to defend himself, but instead he actually preaches to the Sanhedrin. What incredible courage he had. He was so passionate about Jesus and con not concerned about his own defense. He wanted these men and women to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. He showed them in his message how God had founded the nation of Israel and he had made it for the Israelites to inhabit. He showed how Israel had rejected God time and time again. How God had delivered the nation time and time again, trying to get his people to obey him. And then he ended off with eight charges that he made to the nation of Israel and these leaders. And one of those charges included the murder of God's own son. His message was very convincing and very convicting. Both the leaders and the people were convicted. Conviction can either cause two things in our lives. We can respond in one of two ways. It can make us turn to God and confess, or on the other hand, it can make us react against God and actually reject God. Three things are highlighted uh, here with the Jewish court and the people that are present. First, we know very clearly that they had the opportunity to hear the gospel again. They were convicted while Stephen was preaching to them. They were given another chance. The second thing is, we read, they were furious. The Greek word used here for furious means to show a violent reaction. They had no intention of confessing that they had been wrong. And the third word, that uh, the third thing we see is that it says they gnashed their teeth. This means to, to, to bite or to grind your teeth just like a pack of snarling dogs would do. The people were outraged, filled with anger and malice, ready to release violence and unleash their furious emotions. For a believer, the Holy Spirit gives us control over our emotions and we submit to Him. And that's important for us to remember, friends, that we live under the control of the Holy Spirit. We never need to allow our emotions to take control of us. When you think about it, when the human heart rebels against God, it becomes tormented. Rebellion against God causes the human heart to be insecure and troubled. But note here how faithful Stephen was. It wasn't his purpose to escape condemnation. He didn't want to die. God puts that in our hearts, that we want to live. But he was not willing to deny the truth in order to save his life. He was just wanting to proclaim the truth, hoping that the leaders of Israel and of this nation would heed the call of God and be saved. Let's go on to the next two verses, verse 55 
and verse 56. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to the heavens and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The Lord's presence was there with Stephen. We are promised in Scripture. The Lord says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And that was the exact testimony of Stephen. We've got to realize that God is always with us. And particularly when we're in crisis and going through dark times, as a child of God, we can be assured of this. Stephen was doing what Jesus had instructed him to do, to bear testimony to the world. He had the promise of Jesus, I will be with you always. Jesus was there with Stephen, even at this challenging time. And Jesus is with us in our darkest moments. We read in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are there beside me. Stephen was living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and was given the power and the grace to bear what he had to go through and whatever lay ahead. God gave a vision of heaven to Stephen as this man here, as we've read so many times, he was full of the Holy Spirit in chapter 6, in chapter 7, and again here, and being full of the Holy Spirit, God gives him this vision, enabling him to see into the eternal realm, this spiritual dimension. And I believe God still does that for people today. I've heard many stories about that. And I know as my mother sat with my grandmother on her deathbed, the last words my grandmother said were, Oh Lord, it's so beautiful here. It's so beautiful here, Lord. Stephen saw the glory of God. He saw God in his full splendor and his radiance. Stephen saw Jesus standing there at the right hand of God. And uh, it's actually interesting because we normally read about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, which symbolizes that he is Lord and has authority as our Lord and intercessor. But here we see him standing at the right hand of God. And I believe that that speaks to us of the fact that he was there with his eye on Stephen, looking at what was happening, his care for Stephen is uh, highlighted in the fact that he is standing there. And Jesus was standing there joyfully and ready to welcome his faithful servant, Stephen. And I believe that this will be the experience of believers as they pass away into the presence of God and those who have passed away into the presence of God. We will see the, and experience the glory of God. We will see what Stephen saw and even much more. The Bible tells us in a twinkling of an eye, the genuine believer will pass from this life into eternal life, not tasting death, but experiencing life in Jesus. God gives Stephen this glorious testimony here. Seeing such a scene, Stephen bursts forth, proclaiming the glorious vision that he was experiencing. This was just a natural outburst. He was seeing it, and, and so he couldn't stop saying what he was, what he was seeing. And uh, that is the truth that he had and the assurance that he had of the believer's internal life. I want to re-emphasize here, Jesus is there with Stephen. And Stephen just begins to declare, he's seeing Jesus there. We need to know that our faith in Jesus is not in vain. Jesus is always with us and he is true to all his promises, friends. Verse 57 and verse 58 said, as they... At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. You know, it's, you see here, insanity, rage, uncontrolled emotions. They drive the crowd to murderous behavior. 
And you need to know two things here about the very, very foolish things that this group did. First of all, their foolish rejection. The persecutors here are, were opposing the one person who wanted to help them. Stephen wanted to minister to them. He was offering them hope of salvation. That's exactly what Jesus did. That was the sole purpose of Stephen's message, to offer them hope and life in Jesus Christ. I want to say, as believers, that should also be our sole purpose, to minister to those who are desperate, so that we can share with them about the life we have in Jesus Christ. This is the call of believers. It doesn't matter what you're going through. We should always remember that we have been empowered to be witnesses. And that's regardless of our circumstances. Whatever predicament we find ourselves in, we are to minister in the name of Jesus, our Lord. This crowd, their rage and their malice, call them to do very dangerous things. And note what they did here. It says they yelled at the top of the voices. They were trying to blot out what they were hearing. The message of life they were hearing, they were shouting to drown that out. They covered their ears, again, to stop hearing the truth. And we can sometimes do that when we don't want to hear the truth. We, we cover our ears so we don't hear them. That's what these people were doing. And then they rush towards Stephen and they attack him and take out vengeance on him. They drag him out and stoned him. Why? Because they didn't want to hear the message and they wanted to get rid of the man who was bearing the message. They wanted to get rid of that convicting message. The second level of foolishness was the foolishness of the leadership. A person who is responsible for persecuting Christians is in rebellion against God. Those who follow such a leader are following a person who is reacting against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not, they're not acting against the believer. They're acting against God himself. The man who took the lead in Stephen's murder was Saul of Tarsus. And I want to say it's a dangerous thing to follow anyone who's in rebellion. The path of rebellion always leads into destruction. This is the first time that Saul is mentioned in Scripture. And we all know the wonderful testimony of his conversion later on. Verse 59 says, While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You know, that shows Stephen's incredible confidence in the person in whom he believed and put his trust. Don't be mistaken here. Yeah? He was experiencing the pain and suffering of this trial and all that he was going through. Remember, believers aren't exempted from suffering and hardships and trials and even martyrdom. But we have the promise. We have that promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. Stephen called upon the Lord himself who he saw. It was Jesus he saw standing at the right hand of God, ready to receive him. Jesus said he wants all believers to be with us. We read that in the book of John. He says, I want you to be where I am. And Stephen called to Jesus to receive his spirit. He was still trusting in the grace of God. He was still trusting the righteousness of Jesus for his complete salvation. Stephen had trusted and lived for Jesus during his life. And so he knew that he could trust Jesus for life with him eternally. And he was going to be with Jesus. He was going to be where Jesus was. Jesus was in heaven at the right hand of God. Stephen and all other believers are to be with Jesus in heaven. That's our destiny, to be with him forever and ever. Verse 60 says, Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. We see Stephen's incredible loving and forgiving spirit here. And how important it is for us to love and forgive. 
His last act was to kneel in prayer and to plead for those who were persecuting him and murdering him. This is exactly like Jesus. Stephen had the same spirit of Christ and he prayed the same prayer that Jesus prayed. Luke 23 verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And I want to say to you, friends, this morning, forgiveness is so important to us. We can't live our lives with unforgiveness. We're not meant to live with unresolved issues with people. We need to resolve issues. We need to forgive because when we forgive, we are liberated. We think that holding a bitterness and a grudge towards a person is harming them. The only person it harms is us. And in order to be liberated, we need to forgive. The statement, do not hold this against them, highlights three things. First of all, as I said, it, 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 it highlights the fact that Stephen was filled with compassion for his persecutors. He wanted them to be saved. He didn't want vengeance. He was crying out for justice. He wasn't crying out for what he wanted. He was saying, God, don't hold this against them. He wanted them to find life and truth in Jesus Christ. The second thing that we need to understand from this statement is that people will be charged for their sins. And the third thing is we need to realize that the only way that sin can be removed and the charges of sin can be removed to make us acceptable before God is through Jesus Christ himself. And he is the one who forgives us. What a wonderful scripture. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just note another thing in verse 60 about his departure. It simply says in scripture, he fell asleep. There is really no awful death experience for a believer. Stephen Stephen simply passed from this life into eternal life, an experience that amounts to nothing more than falling asleep passing on from one level of existence into an eternal level of existence. And this word sleep is interestingly often used to describe the death of a believer. As I close off this morning, I want to just highlight a few of the things that I've said. We've spoken a lot. We've spoken about a lot of things this morning. But a few of the things I want to stress this morning. The first thing is that God will never leave us or forsake us. Even in our darkest times, in the darkest hours of your life, God is with you. He is there with you. And you might not feel his presence, but he is there. The second thing that I want to remind you of is that Stephen lived in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Even here, where he has been stoned and he has been persecuted, The Bible says he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And we see that in terms of the vision he has. We need to continue to live our lives in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, daily being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I want to also mention the fact that Stephen was a man who forgave. And forgiveness is so important in our lives. Not to hold things against others. No matter what the offense might be, we need to forgive others. And then finally, I want to say, we are empowered to be witnesses. You've heard me say that again and again and again, and I will continue to say that because that should be our mission and our passion, just as it was the mission and passion of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. May the Lord challenge our hearts today through his word. The Lord richly bless you.
A very happy Sunday morning to you, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Lord's Table. It's a nice breezy afternoon here in the Middle East. You know, as I was reading through today's passage, we often focus in on the beautiful sight that Stephen beheld, where Jesus stood at the right hand of the Father, standing in affirmation of Stephen as Stephen stood for Christ. And that is an amazing sight to behold. But when I read verse 60, Then falling on his knees, after being stoned, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I immediately thought about our Lord on the cross. Recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, there is a difference here in the request. Jesus, who has the power to forgive sins, was telling his father, forgive them. Stephen was just pleading to the father not to hold the sins against them. And yet the similar thing is what I want to focus on. Although the world was literally against Stephen, like Jesus, he had grace on those who were persecuting him. And I want to say to us, Should we walk in that truth? Absolutely. The world seems like it's getting darker and more evil every day. And we might be prone to say, Lord, give them what they deserve. Bring down your fire, your wrath, and your judgment. But what kept Stephen from saying that? The very grace of Jesus saying, you know what? I deserve that wrath, that fire, that judgment. And by God's grace and by the blood of Christ, I have been forgiven. And even in that moment where Stephen was being persecuted and murdered for the truth, he saw pity on those who had not accepted the truth. He knew he would not have accepted the truth apart from the grace of Christ. So, beloved, I pray that this week as the world continues to seem to get more and more harsh and hostile to the gospel, would the grace of God be that more effective and powerful in your life that you could say, Lord, don't hold these sins against them, not sweep them under the rug, but open their eyes to Jesus and his perfect sacrifice that their sins may be atoned by his blood. And that's why we celebrate the Lord's table. That He has done that for us, and we are still on this earth because He's doing that for others. His body was broken for His people. His blood was shed for His people. And we are proclaiming to the nations, to His people, come and accept this perfect sacrifice. And in that heart of gratitude, in that heart of grace, let us take the bread as Jesus took on that night. He broke the bread, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the new covenant shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. Father, the same grace that allowed you to say, Father, forgive them, those who were murdering you and crucifying you. The same grace and love that was in Stephen while being murdered was able to say, Lord, don't hold their sins against them. May we say that about the people around us, the people who mean us harm and mean us trouble. Lord, their eyes have not been opened. They're blind. And if it wasn't for your grace, we'd be joining them and persecuting others, just as Saul was a persecutor until you opened his eyes and you made Paul the greatest proclaimer outside of Jesus Christ this world has ever known. Your love and your grace is the only thing that can do that. So as we walk through these truly dark times, anticipating your arrival, may we not look at the world in judgment, hoping they get what they deserve, because we know if we were getting what we deserved, we would all deserve your wrath. But Lord, we pray that you would extend the same grace that you extended to us, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family. We thank you for how you extended that grace to us on the cross. And we pray that we may be beacons and ambassadors of your grace and your love and your mercy this week. We can only do this in your strength. And we can only do this in your name, the only name by which men must be saved, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. 
Amen. Have a wonderful week, Union Church. Be blessed. So maybe